Thank you, Paula, for the introduction. Let me share my slides. The idea of this secure routing tutorial is basically to show you the key issues that have an impact on the internet routing and the potential solutions. Before I start, the way the tutorial is going to work is that we are going to stop now and then as we complete the topics. The idea is that you could ask questions in the Q&A panel and uh, during the pauses we'll read two or three questions. And then if there are any comments or if there's anybody that wants to raise their hand, you may do so. And at the end of the tutorial, well, depending on the time available, we'll give you the floor if you want to speak. But uh, we prefer you to use the Q&A to ask questions. And you can uh, wait until we have a, a break or a pause. So it's not to interrupt uh, the, the talk. So first, we're going to talk about uh, the key routing incident types. What do we mean by routing incidents? Basically, it's a hijacks, route hijacks. What is a, a route hijack? It's announcing prefixes that are, we are not authorized to announce. This may be intentional because of operation errors. As you know, BGP does not have any mechanisms, any security uh, mechanisms of the protocol. So announcing an unauthorized prefix is something that may happen. You may do it and, and BGP has no control about it. So here you have an example. For instance, this client wants to go to this address, 2001 db 8 20 that is in this autonomous system, 2001 db 8 40 So when this one wants to go there, it sends the traffic to its default gateway and the autonomous system 65501 will have the BGP tables telling him that in order to get to this, 2001 DB8 FF 0 slash 40 has to go to 65502 and then to 65510. And here you have another IPv4 address and uh, the route to take you that, there. Now this, so this router knows how to get there through two autonomous systems. Now, what happens if, as we said, BGP doesn't have its own mechanism for detecting that what you announce is actually what is appropriate, what corresponds? Now, what happens if there's somebody that starts announcing a block, such as um, a 2000 uh, for something more specific an R48? Now that uh, slash trend, this slash 48 will reach the autonomous system uh, 65501 because it has no filters and as one prefix is, is more precise than the other, he would take this one. So when this client wants to get to this address instead of doing the previous route, we'll have a new route and its traffic will be taken to another autonomous system. So this is, in a nutshell, what a hijack is. And as we said, not always is it malicious. Very often it is, but sometimes it may be configuration errors. What are the types of incidents that we have? It's a, a route uh, uh, leak that is announcing a set of uh, of prefixes outside of its scope. So we see an either and we announce it, and that uh, should not be announced. For instance, 
we have prefixes that we learn from a provider that should not be announced or another peer or another provider that is a transit provider that announces routes a complete bgp table and we have another transit provider and we should not announce it uh, again and the same thing about the peering so that we learn from a peer should not be announced by another peering or to an another provider we should only announce it to clients in this example let's assume that the autonomous system 65536 announces a network that is 2001 db8 uh, 10 40 to its transit provider and to appearing and receives other prefixes from here if this is appearing link 65537 should not take it up to another autonomous system because peering is only between these two autonomous systems so if this has no filters configured normally what it receives is going to be announced so there we have a leak that is a route there's a filtration there's a leak with filters and so it's possible for some traffic not to take this route and it should have so that is the other case of the leak so we saw hijacks and leaks now what is the current status of uh, the security incidents and um, the statistics these are statistics from different sources one is by augusto maturin who developed this for lacnic and it's available at uh, the website he gathered the security incidents from 2017 to part of 2019 and it was complemented with manners observatory where they also uh, conduct an analysis and you see that things are getting better but it's still a very high number of incidents yearly about 4,000. and you may see that the number of hijacks is higher to 2019 and 2020 we compare them against each other and you see that the leaks and high plus hijacks is reduced by eight percent leaks went significantly down they dropped that means that more organizations adopted uh, took action to improve uh, routing security but apparently there are more hijacks now this also the source is manners and here there's an article that you can download now there's a detail here although we have more hijack incidents if we analyze them more in detail what this what the hijacks analyze is how many bgp collectors detect those hijacks and of those collectors that we have or different sites in the world where do they come from from how many peers so more than 20 percent 22 percent of the hijacks were detected by from one to five peers and more than 47 percent that is more than 50 by less than 30 peers this means that fewer and fewer peers um, of uh, the collectors uh, got the right, uh, wrong direction so that they were filtered before this is a good thing it shows that the security measures the security actions are working because the bgp collectors that are detecting these hijacks detect them from the peers that announce them and increasingly uh, there are fewer and fewer peerings that are announcing those hijacks that's a significant piece of information we you may understand it better if you read this article but it's uh, just a piece of information well i'm going to i don't think you have any questions yet so let's see what we can do to mitigate incidents what are the actions available to improve the uh, incidents one of the key recommendations or set of practices is month 
manners. Manners is a set of agreed standards, mutually agreed standards for routing security. It's an initiative that was launched by Internet Society. And this includes different actions. Mostly this has to do with filtering, with the PGP announcements, anti-spoofing techniques, coordination between operators and global validation. There is also a MANUS program that was initially considered for network operators, and it has a specific program for traffic exchange points and one for CDNs. We're going to focus on this part of the tutorial. Uh, we're going to focus on global validation. All the others are very well known to you. And this is the one which we are most interested in, in these events that we would like to comment on. So when one has different traffic relationships between autonomous systems, one can identify autonomous systems that do peering with one another, autonomous systems that have clients. Down here we have the clients and each autonomous system has transit links. So the first thing that I wanted to comment on, what are the considerations we have to bear in mind when receiving or making announcements? This is the basis of what we have to take into account in order to avoid mistakes like the one we mentioned previously. So when we receive, for example, an announcement from a client, from an autonomous system, normally this can be propagated either to the transit or to the peering links, and that is fine, that's correct. Now the autonomous system 65502 that received this route from a peering link should not send these forward, neither to the transit nor to another peering. These two should not happen. So this is a first consideration. What we receive from peering should not be forwarded neither by peering nor as transit. Another consideration is that what we receive through a transit link is then announced to the clients from our autonomous system, but this should not be forwarded to a peering link. Finally, if this autonomous system shows routes through the peering link that we have, which is just for peering between two organizations, these can be sent to the clients, that is okay, but it should not go to the transit link nor to the peering link. These rules are very simple, but are the basis for not making routing mistakes. And these are the ones that we should take into account when filtering the announcements that we do. Now, how do we go about filtering? The simplest way is through communities. This is like labeling what we receive from one transit to another and from clients. So this allows us to label the BGP announcements, divide them into classes, and then each group of announcements is forwarded in the corresponding direction. There are proposals at present at IETF of changing the BGP and incorporating these considerations when one configures a BGP, stating directly whether this is a peering link, a transit link, or a client link. There is no standard yet in place, but work is being done in order to avoid these things. So as we said, it is very important to configure the incoming and outgoing filters. As for outgoing filters, the considerations we just mentioned, the AS65501 can apply filters to the announcements it carries out through prefixes, our AS path, by communities, etc. However, this autonomous system has no way of knowing what it should learn from the autonomous system 
865502. What prefixes it has, what autonomous systems are behind it, what is the scope of the announcements of the 65502? It cannot know unless it has information that the 65502 provides. And as we said, that information does not come in BGP. Therefore, 65502 will have to provide this separately outside the BGP. Now, how does it go about this? Well, that's what we look at now. And there are two ways to do so. This is what we're going to do with the technologies provided by the security incident prevention. How can we check that the information we receive through PGP is correct? There are two ways, the internet routing registries and RPKI. This allows us to have separate databases from the VGP that will allow us to contrast the announcements we receive through VGP. In that way, we can check each announcement that we receive and see whether this corresponds with what has been registered in these databases. As regarding the internet routing registries, well, these are data databases in text form that have information on the routing policies of the organizations. These are defined using the definition of objects in those databases. This is something that has been in place for quite a number of years. There are many internet routing registers in the world. The most famous one is RADB, but there are many more. LACNIC has its own IRR since last year. And the idea here is that what an organization registers in this database, then other ISPs or operators can then use to generate filters for BGPs and very often automatically. There are tools to configure the routers automatically using this information. So let us look at the details. An example of a registry is what we see here. We do a query for RADB. Here we have the route objects with a prefix and the origin autonomous system and the data of who created this register. Now, the important thing is the association between a prefix and the origin autonomous system. This will allow us to check that the BGP announcements correspond with this. How do we use this IRR information? Well, if we have a peering in this example of the 65501, which has two networks, one in IPv6 and one in IPv4, and 65502 also. So 65501, if they wish to apply a filter on when in incoming, and this was a complicated thing because 65501 did not have the information of this one here. So what they can do is to check whether 65502 has something defined in the IRR. In this way, it will be able to see which route objects are, have this autonomous system as an origin. In other words, this here, if they look like this, the origin autonomous system. And having found that, it can enable that prefix list. And this is done as follows. The simplest way is to do a query in the IRR of LACNIC with a who is. And these are two queries which have a specific syntax and it puts the IPv6 prefix originated in the autonomous system 65502 and these are the IPv4 prefixes. So that gives you the list for each and this can then apply the access list. This is one of the ways of seeing this manually. We can then also 
have a bit more complex example, which is a transit example. 65501 here wants to learn from 65502 not only the networks of the 65502, but also the networks of their clients, of its clients or the organizations this client provides transit to. How can this happen? Well, it cannot do so. So this one has to help somehow. How does this one here help? It can create what we call an AS set object in the IRR, which simply is a set describing a set of autonomous systems. The AS set has a name. This name often explains the reason, uh, but you needn't deduct it from there. There can be some kind of description or also information stating that this autonomous, what this autonomous system is about. It doesn't have its own semantics. This doesn't mean anything specifically. ASET is a set of autonomous system. What gives meaning to it? Well, this autonomous system and this other one here on the left. But ASET is merely a list, a set of autonomous systems with members. Like all sets, the AS set has members. In this case, the members are 65509, 65510, and 65511. What 65582 might be indicating when mentioning this transit is that in this AS set, the AS set that will be providing transit to come up here. So you can, you know that here you have the AS, AS systems that where transit is provided to, a query can be done and it consults the IRR and obtains the members of that AS set and then a query is done to each member and then you'd have the IPv6 and IPv4 networks. There's a simpler way of doing so, which is using the commands that we saw initially, there was a way of automating this using a BGP Q4. In this case, all that recursive query of obtaining first the member list of the ASC and then that each member, in this case, we have three, but if it were 100, it would be many more, of course. Then for each of the members, the list of networks would be obtained of prefixes, sorry, that this one has. So with that aim, we use this command BGPQ4. We indicate the IRR. We indicate the access list we wish to create. This is a list with a Cisco format, and we include the most important thing, which is the AS set that we wish to expand. This will first if we don't include anything, it will first give us the access list of the IPv4 prefixes. And in this case, when we include a six, it will give us a list of the IPv6 prefixes. So what this command did was to look this up in the LACNIC IRR 65502 AS transit. Then from this AS set, it obtains each of the members, which are autonomous systems. And for each of these members, a additional query to the IRR, and so obtain the list of networks that correspond to each of those autonomous systems. And this will then be printed on the screen. So with this, you can then do the script, which copies this in a router and then generates every now and again the new access list. So what we see here is a Cisco format, which is the default format, but BGP Q4 has different types of platforms, uh, formats for different platforms, for example, for Juniper, for Microtik and others and other manufacturers also for BIRD and others, I assume, that also used. These are references of LACNIC's IRR, BGP, and IRRD version 4, as well as documentation in MILACNIC. I leave this here so that you can find it. 
And now we will stop to see if there are any questions so far. Hasta el momento, no tenemos Erika, ni... any questions? No, we have no questions so far. Eh, bueno. All right. Eh, vamos a seguir entonces. So let us continue. Para que el tiempo no se nos... Nos indican en el chat que hasta el momento todo muy claro. Everything ah, bueno. very clear so far. That's the feedback eh, we've had. Esta parte que viene es un poco quizás... This next section is well not more complicated but it has more information but basically it's the same in addition to what we spoke about digital certificates and everything that we have behind rpki from the standpoint of operations for operators the part they are interested in is a different database than the IRR in order to check the BGP announcements against these. As with the IRR, where I could use this information to generate filters, this is different. This is a validation process, but basically it's the same, checking the BGP announcements against another source of information. Now, what does RPKI do? It defines an infrastructure of a public key to be applied for routing for BGP. And this does the following when a registry like LACNIC or like any of the other regional registries provide provides addresses to an organization, to an ISP or to an operator or to an end user. In addition to that, they receive a digital certificate which are similar to the X509 certificates that you know, but with extensions for representing IPv4, IPv6 addresses, IPv6 addresses, and autonomous system numbers, ASNs. The certificate is a verifiable proof that those that you have a given resource because LACNIC, when assigning resources and when assigning the certificate, LACNIC is associating a private and public key with that resource. Only those that have that private key, key will be able to sign things with it, with that key. So basically, that is the association that is done with our PKI. It generates a PKI. And what is makes up this RPKI solution? Well, there are many proposals for extensions, but what is being used at present are the ROAs. These ROAs are objects equivalent to the IRRs, like Route 6 objects. So this is the link between prefixes and the autonomous system of origin. That is what an ROA does, a ROA. It associates a set of prefixes with an ROA. So in that way, an organization can define who is authorized, which are the autonomous systems authorized to publish certain types of prefixes. Now, what is the benefit of these RPKIs? This, it is because this is digitally signed and you can see the chain of signatures and validate this cryptographically and cannot be easily altered. This is public information and because everything works with public and private keys, it can be published and it is accessible and anyone can download it and check it. What is the difference compared to the IRRs? The IRRs don't have such signatures. It is just a database in plain text. And although there are some mechanisms for authorization and so on and authentication, they're not as strong. It's not like this. In this case, only those that have the private RPKI key will be able to sign the ROAs and create them. 
just in the case of RPKI, only those that have the IPs and that LACNIC assigned them to can sign these, whereas in the IRR, anyone who has a login in that database will be able to do so, and the authorization mechanism is different because it's based on an autonomous system. Entonces, este, so es this is much more solid it's, uh, from point of view of security. Now, apart from that, of those uh, thing or conceptions, and another thing of the IRRs is that as they have been used for so, so long, consider that the uh, RIRs have been used uh, since the 90s, well, as a result, there are there's a lot of information that is not correct. And sometimes it's redundant or even contradictory. So there's information that is wrong and it's still there. So there's a lot of trash. Sometimes it, it's impossible to determine whether an announcement is right. So RPKI is much newer. And on the other hand, the fact that it's only the IP uh, provider that can uh, do it, there are no proxy registers. So uh, that makes this much cleaner, much safer. So those are the ROAs. And uh, another thing that uh, RPKI includes is a prefix validation mechanism, the validation of origin. In the RIRs, this is not part of the mechanism. That is, the RIRs define the syntax of how the objects uh, work, but they don't say how they should be used. And out of tradition, different usage forms have been defined, but uh, there's no specification, actually. So how, how is the validation of origin? The validation of origin consists of the following. Precisely, what we're going to do is to validate that the autonomous system that originates a certain prefixes is the, the right one. How does this work in practice? Well, you have to install the so-called validating cache, cache in the, our organization, and that uh, what they will do is that this validating cache is, is going to uh, bring and validate uh, the um, repositories uh, where you have the certificates and the ROAs, uh, the cache does all the cryptographic validation, checking the cryptographic information. And after that, what will be left is a list of pairs between prefixes and autonomous systems. And with that information, it feeds the routers using the, an RTR protocol. A los routers. Y luego los routers, una vez que tienen esa, esa, esa lista de, de, de lo que está en caché, que, que es básicamente. Pues they have that list in the caché, that is basically the association between the prefix and the autonomous systems will be able to validate the update when they receive an update if it uh, is consistent with, with what the ROAs say, it's going to be okay. And if it doesn't uh, match, it will be wrong, and that is what defines the validity state. So once the routers receive the information of the caches, they will have tables like this, the prefix, length, maximum length of the uh, uh, disaggregation and the autonomous system of origin. With this, you can provide a state of validity to each update of the GP. So you will be able to say, well, if the Autonomous system of origin is the right one because it's consistent with the ROA and the maximum length match. Well, that's going to be a valid update. If they don't, if any of those two things do not 
coincide, but if there is an ROA, it's going to be invalid. And this is third situation is when there's no ROA created. That's the case where the organization has not created the ROAs. That is precisely what we treat, try to do with these tutorials, to have more and more organizations creating the ROAs for the prefixes, because they, they then ensure that there are no invalid announcements because other organizations organizations are checking this so and and the different possibilities are valid invalid or no roa created not found so this would be the more theoretical part of our pki and here again, I'm going to stop and ask whether you have any questions. Any questions so far, Erika? Yes, we do have one. It's by Guillermo Pagliero, and he says, I, are they studying any way that the system may uh, tell the administrator of the resource before the ROAs uh, stop being valid? Well, in the case of LACNIC, that is renewed automatically so the, it's not uh, announced uh, there are no alerts but the roas uh, are renewed automatically and in the case well rpki has two modalities one is uh, hosted in lacnic and the other one is delegated that is one that is the organization may install a software to install the uh, to, uh, to to uh, manage their uh, ROAs and they, they need a specific software. So it's there, it's the organization itself that should be in charge of uh, keeping an eye on the validity and the certificates and the ROAs. Good, that was the only question. Well, if I'm not wrong, we are very close to the break. Pasa y 55, nos quedan tres minutos. We have three minutes left, actually. I don't know whether there are any more questions, any comments, Erika. No. We, um, they are telling us that it's very clear and that finally they understood what the asset was for. That's Demian Pesile. Well, so that's the only question. I think that you were clear enough and uh, you made good use of your time. Well, and then the other thing what we have left is from the practical point of view, Erika will give, show you how the ROAs are created and she will give the examples that I mentioned earlier that the ROAs that should be created, etc. So, Paula, would you like to? Yes, uh, Guillermo, we see that Carlos Canani asks another question. Does the RPKI validate uh, the origin of the prefix alone? What was the question? I repeat, does RPKI validate the origin of the prefix alone? Yes, the RPKI precisely, it's called the validation of origin precisely because we own, they own, it only validates the origin of the prefix. Only this, who is the autonomous system originating a prefix. There are different proposals to validate uh, the, uh, as it passed, uh, one is, uh, uh, um, uh, but in practice, uh, it's, uh, the other possibilities has not been very popular and apparently the operators are not going to implement it. BGSP SEC, uh, the idea was that it would validate the entire path. Then as that was not too successful, there are other proposals uh, around. One is called ASPA. That is also moving forward, but it's not a standard yet. And this is 
an issue that is still under debate because indeed the only thing this validate is the autonomous system of origin and not the entire path. Very good, perfect. Well, those were all the questions. So thank you a lot, Guillermo, for uh, the knowledge you shared in this part of the tutorial and the, the over 230 people that are with us. I invite you to a 15 minute break and then we'll go on with the second part of the tutorial. See you later. So Guillermo, well, good afternoon. My greetings to all the participants that are connected uh, for today's session. Guillermo told you a while ago that we're going to start going through what uh, RPKI does in practice, and we are going to focus on two examples based on the examples that Guillermo just uh, gave us of peering and transited for the exercises so that we can share the different uh, things uh, uh, so as to practice RPKI in the networks. Remember that for each of the spaces, we're going to have time for questions. We, you may write them down in the panel, in the Q&A panel, in, and there we, you'll have some time after the explanation is over, after the presentation, so that we can answer them. So starting with ROAs, Guillermo explained them. You remember that these um, are, are digitally uh, created uh, certificates and we'll see that they will be the equivalent if, if they speak of the objects that we have in the RIRs with around six. So what we'll be able to do is to generate with the ROA, we can uh, generate a certificate for, uh, for a, a, a prefix for the autonomous system to, to indicate that this is the real autonomous uh, um, uh, origin. So remember that before we started with the break, Guillermo mentioned that for validation of origin, we are going to be able to show the states in three. We are going to have a state of non-found, a valid state, and a non-valid or invalid state. So we're going to see now in practice how you can check the BGP certificates and you're going to, we're going to classify each of the announcements based on that. Another very important thing is that these ROAs cannot be altered by a third party. And the final thing is that, well, the repository is absolutely secure. Remember also that the ROAs are signed cryptographically and we don't have the NRIR, the objects are not signed cryptographically. So that's a big difference in, uh, between the two. So semantically, this is the equivalent of a road sick, but uh, in RIR, it is not signed cryptographically. So RPKI in that respect is more secure. Now let's see how these, um, let's see what we need to consider when defining the ROAs, these digital certificates. The main thing that we need to understand is that the entities that they have their own resources that were assigned either because of your, uh, by, by the, your internet registry or LACNIC or NIC BR or NIC uh, MX, you're going to be able to create these ROAs. How can these certificates be created? We're going to see it step by step. All these certificates were delivered directly by LACNIC. We, we can do it through me LACNIC. The, it's LACNIC's resource administration system. And you can enter with your username and uh, the uh, password, but remember that you may have different users name. So the one that we are going to enter is the username that has the all the technical permits to produce the 
uh, certificate. Para la generación de los ROAS. ¿Qué pasa cuando tenemos organizaciones que, por ejemplo, no tienen recursos propios? Y no What sido... happens with all the, those organizations that don't have their own resources or are using the resources given to them by the internet service provider, which is one of the most common cases we have in the IPD for networks. In this sense, what we are going to be able to do is, well, we don't have our own resources, so we will be defending on our internet service providers so that they generate these ROAs for us. So this will be a request that we have to send to the ISP requesting the, so that these prefixes that we're using for the routing so that they can enter the platform and generate or create these digital certificates, which are the ROAs. There can be several organizations that have resources, IP resources, that have their addressing in IPv4 and in IPv6, but do not have an autonomous system como están haciendo sus anuncios, lo realizan de manera que... What they're publishing is through their own IPv4 IPv6 address. El sistema autónomo de su, de su upstream provider. The autonomous system of the upstream provider. Los certificados digitales se van a crear. Los always have to have this rule, namely to indicate what is the origin autonomous system. So this will be able to validate the autonomous system with which the prefix is being announced. Or if you have a multi-homing with multiple service providers, we have to create our ROAs with our respective addressing prefixes that we are publishing for each of the autonomous system. The ones we're using for the publication. This is done by ourselves through the Milaknik system. And in case of this being a service provider, being the owner of the resources or some other organization, then they will be responsible for entering the system and creating that digital certificate. That is another difference that we have compared to the example that Guillermo showed us regarding the IRRs. So in this case, this is done by the autonomous system of origin. So what are the things we have to take into account to create a ROA? There are two rules, two general rules that we have to take into account to create the ROAs. First of all, we have to verify how we're making the announcements. We will see what the routes are that we are publishing. And if we have here, for example, As we have in this example, network 203.0.1.12.0 slash 22, we're going to validate this network, which is the one we received from LACNIC, for example. If this is being published in a summarized way, if it is the entire prefix 22, or if we're disaggregating it into different prefixes and blocks to make this publication. We have to validate whether we, in fact, are publishing this in a summarized way. Well, in that case, we just have to create the digital certificate for the ROA for that network. But if we are disaggregating it somehow or other in a slash 23 or a slash 24, we will then have to generate the ROAs for the we have to change the ROAs for the prefixes we are disaggregating from the network, that network for the purpose of publishing these. In addition to that, we, this validation of the announcements we are making on the second point, what we're going to validate 
is with what autonomous system we are originating this publication. If it is our own autonomous system or if there's an AS that we have received from a ISP. So that AS has we have to be clear as to what AS we're using for the announcement to create the AROA. So these are the data that we have to have when creating it. <clears throat> it is also important to know if the different blocks are being disaggregated and if these are always announced with the same AS or if they can be announced through different ASs. In that way, we should also create the ROA for the, each of the different ASs that are used for the announcement of that network that we are announcing. The most important thing is that these for these digital certificates, the ROA should respect this general rule, the AS of origin and how we're using the these, whether summarized or disaggregated. And this way we're validating all our publications. Now, what if we generate a ROA where we publish this in a disaggregated way? and we're not generating the ROA of the slash 24, but we're only generating the global ROA for the 203, 0, 112, 0, 2, 0 slash 22. What would happen if we create the ROA, but we're announcing it in a disaggregated way? In that case, we are validating all our publications. You shall, you shall remember that we have three types of states in the validation of origin, invalid, valid, or not found. So we have a not found state when we see that at a given time, the BGP will find a not found state. We'll realize then that this is a ROA that does not exist. It will be searched in the different repositories and it will appear as that is, has not been created. But what if we created it, but we didn't create it properly? We created it for the entire network. So in that case, it will be found, but if they compare it with the announcement they receive, it won't coincide with the digital certificate that we created. So in that case, it will appear as invalid. We're being invalidating our own publications. That is why we have to be very clear as to this and do a verification as to how we are announcing the routes from our infrastructure. So here, as I said, we have to see what we should take into account. So based on this, we'll be able to see how we can generate these ROAs, whether summarized or disaggregated, and how we all the things we have to take into account for in terms of the infrastructure. This is an example. We have two networks with different ASs. They establish a peering connection in these networks. We have the first network, AS65501, and it tells us that this 65501 network has the following prefixes. It has an IPv6 prefix 2001 db8 20 colon slash 48 and in IPv4 we have 2030113 slash 24 so we are publishing this we're publishing a slash 48 in IPv6 and slash 24 in IPv4 and we have the other network that we established for the peering, which is autonomous system 65502. And this autonomous system is going to publish network 2001db810 slash 48 and 192.0.2.0 slash 24 for IPv4, the other one in IPv6. So in this case, we see that each owns its own autonomous system in this case we are using an autonomous system that is not our own, but we have these prefixes that are our own and will be announced. Now, let us see 
which are the digital certificates for these rowers that we have to create in order to establish that relationship, that trust relationship, and then secure routing. So we're going to indicate that, in fact, this autonomous system that we have here, 65502, and the addressing IP4 addressing prefix is this slash 24, and it comes from uh, this is the interface that you will find when you enter the Milaknik platform. And then you have to try and create the ROAS here in the Milaknik platform. On the left side, you have an item where you have the RPKI resources, and there you have the space to start with the creation of this. This is the interface you will encounter and you will see which is the data that you have to complete for this. You have to give it a name, a name to the rower, to the certificate you are creating. Here I put a rower peering ASN 65502, the autonomous system with which we are making the publication of our announcements. In other words, how we are originating this route is 65501. So we're going to create the rowers for the first autonomous system that we have over here. So it's 65501, that's the autonomous system. And the validation validity period is from this to this other date. This is the validity period for the certificate. Normally, these are quite extended periods. <laughs> she apologizes. So from the moment this is announced, we're going to disaggregate it further maybe. So we have to take that into account normally these certificates have quite a long validity period, maybe one year or two years. In this case, we're going to indicate which is the ROA, the addressing resource that we're going to generate for this digital certificate. In this case, for the 65501, Yes, we're going to create the three ROAs that we have here. We're going to create the one for the IPv4 network, which is the one that indicates the network from which this disaggregation is taking place. We're going to create the prefix that is the one we are publishing in this connection, for in this peering connection. And then we're going to publish, we're going to generate the ROA for the IPv6. And this shows us that this addressing was received. So that's the first rower. The validity period is two years. And then we're going to indicate the prefix we have here. We're then going to create the rower for the disaggregated prefix. So here we're going to indicate that this network is a 22 network, it's a 22 prefix, but it was already disaggregated to a 24 to be announced, and so, and so we can announce it. So we are creating this second ROA, which is the one that shows us this connection. So we include what prefix X comes from and how far we are disaggregating it, which is a mass 24. And if we include a name, this is my autonomous system of origin, the validity period, and the prefix. And now we're going to generate this in IPv6. It's just this prefix over here. And this is the one that we received from the internet registry. It's a slash 48, and this is how I'm going to publish it. So it has a validity period of two years. The ASN of origin is 65501, and here we have created our three rowers for this connection. Now let us have a look at the rowers for the other autonomous system 
with which we're doing this connection, which is 65502. In this case, it told us that it had two prefixes to publish, one 192020-24 and 1-48 in IPv6. And it's been disaggregated in a 22 network for, in a prefix that they received from the internet registry and they are going to disaggregate it into a 24 mask. So the certificate with the autonomous system, in this case, it's 65502 and we indicate the validity two years. So that's the first network. So here we are going to put the segregated network that is the one that we have published with a slash 22 and it's being disaggregated to a mask 24 in IPv4. And um, the addressing in IPv6, uh, so we have created the ROAs for the peering connection from the autonomous system 65502 uh, and uh, um, the other one. So here, let's see what um, is uh, this autonomous system 65508 is acting as uh, in this infrastructure, it's working as a transit network for these uh, three networks, 10, 11, and 09. So here we'll see that through the, the different, these three networks will have to go through the one in the middle to reach the one on the left. So what are the ROAs that we need to create? In this scenario, we already have five autonomous systems. Each of them have their own addressing to publish to reach ASN 65501. So we're going to see what are the digital certificates that we need to create for the new networks that interconnect with this transit example. So for ASN 65501, that were the ROAs that we already created, we have indeed these three ROAs considering that they come from a prefix 22 network and we are disaggregating. These are ROAs that we have already created of the autonomous system 65501 and, and 502, they were already created. And now we'll see for 60, for 509, the, we're only publishing this uh, slash 48 and the same for 11 and the same for 09, but for IPv4. And so we need uh, for a prefix 24. So we for each of these, we are going to publish the prefixes that are being published. 65509 received an addressing mask 24, and this is what is being published to establish that connection. In uh, 6510, they're only publishing an IPv6 prefix, so this is the ROA that we need to create, and the 65511 is uh, this uh, slash 48 for IPv6. So let's see how the announcements are made for each of the connections that we have here and how we will see the this information in our writing table that we are going to put together in this transit um, sketch. What is the information that the autonomous system of destination receives? In this case, 65501. Well, we have this uh, with Establish this connection in this peering. We have it established with this address in IPv6, 2001, DB8, BB2. And here it's known through this connection, it's going to get this information. So the network DB810, that is the IPv6 prefix 48, that autonomous system uh, 65502. And in ASPATH, you see the autonomous system of the network 65502. So it delivers the information with an IPv6 addressing. And anyway, through that connection, you know, addressing uh, 192 slash 24, that is IPv4. And in ASPATH, the only autonomous system that it will know is 65502. Then, 
having established this connection with the autonomous uh, with transit system this 65510 will publish its uh, uh, this prefix in ipv6 and uh, the as path shows where the route originates and here it gets to the transit autonomous system and it will known by the autonomous uh, uh, system 65501 but you see that here you have the different asns through which our announcement goes so we have 65510 that is the one that originated uh, the announcement and 65502 our transit autonomous system and the same applies to 65511 6, 65511 this is uh, the one published and then the transit uh, and then this is what the uh, destination receives uh, and they receive the aspa through which uh, the um, announcement was made and this is available to the destination autonomous system 65501 now the 65509 is an ipv4 it enters this transit autonomous system and it is known by our by the asm of origin 501 so in this here you see the bgp table we are removing a lot of attributes that are shown in one of these tables but we just focus on the ones that are necessary for this task of the rpki validation in our bgp table of the router we have autonomous uh, system uh, 655501 we know the network this is information that we have we know the different networks the one of uh, the autonomous system uh, 65502 and um, the ipv4 of the autonomous system and that of the other autonomous systems 09, 11, and 10. As we see here, we, we are adding the path uh, as more information as it goes. And so far, then, this is the information available in our BGP table. We don't have any validation tables. Now, we are not validating origin, but rather we have this transit connection with a different autonomous system and the information received. That is why this validity state is still with a question mark. It's important to point out that this information that we're going to see the uh, uh, validity state in, and it's, this is a, an additional attribute that we will add to the table when we see in this validation of origin through RPKI so here we have all this information, the state of, that, of uh, validity. Let's remember that because of the normal operations of BGP, they're always going to look for the shortest path available. And it's also important to remember that we have networks contained within others, the packets will always be taken to the more specific route. So please consider that too. We are always going to choose the more specific route. So if we had a validation scheme in this transit system that we have here, if it were complete, here you see the other elements of a validation scheme. He, he, this is a server that is going to be our cache uh, server validated by cache. Uh, validating cache and this will th this will be a server that we will have in our infrastructure hosted in our infrastructure we'll see later on what is the software that you can install all the various softwares available that can with which you can build this validate uh, in this infrastructure and that validate uh, will establish connection with all the repositories of the five registered internet um, RIRs globally to bring it, to feed it in this repository, you have information of all the digital certificates or the ROAs that have been created, the routes, and this information will be brought locally to connect through this uh, to a router and uh, give the information of the routes that they're receiving. So, now we will see a new 
client connected to the to the system 65 509 we have already created the digital certificates remember for the autonomous system of destination and the transit asn and the asns that are connecting there but we'll see a new client that will be connected to this uh, asn 65 509 and this is a client that already has uh, ipv4 resources for addressing so and it will publish ip4 addressing mask 24 through the asn of its uh, service provider in this case 65509 so what information does our autonomous system 65501 receive bearing in mind that we are are already are doing validation in the last uh, example we had uh, zero uh, validation state but here what is the information that uh, uh, asn 65501 that is asn of destination receives in this bgp table you'll see now the validity states and you know the routes that we already saw And here, the, the point that connected this network, they're all valid. They all have a valid state, but because the ROAs were created. And here you see that for a client that entered to the system last, it's announcing network 27850-24, and the validity state is not found. Why? Because this digital certificate for this announcement uh, of this network this has not been created yet so let's create this roa the addressing prefix 27850 slash 24 mask 24 in ipv4 they are publishing that but as he doesn't have its own uh, uh, validity, he's going to say that it's going to certify it through ASN 65509, which it is connected. And here it has the same validity time, two years. So we generate the certificate and this information will reach the re global repositories of RPKI they will receive the information dependent on the repository. In this case, the example is about American, the Caribbean, so it will reach LACNIC, RIR. And from there, it will issue a, a ROA, a digital certificate created for that prefix. So here we are going to see what is the information that receives. This is a simplified BGP table. And indeed, the autonomous system uh, uh, 501 will know this network 200 785 mask 24 and now you see that the state is valid what is information in the path the autonomous system that is publishing this that it's 65 509 and the autonomous system of transit that is in this case it's 65 502 in addition in this bgp in addition to this BGP table, remember that in this scheme here we have a validating cache that we where we will install our validator software. So we'll see a validation table. And what is the information that it will show? The prefix that we are receiving, the maximum of this prefix in terms of disaggregation or the prefix that this network disaggregates and from which autonomous system it's being published. So we have the two networks of the autonomous system 65502, IPv6 and IPv4. In this case, it is indicating that it's a slash 24. It's a disaggregated and a prefix 22. This is the autonomous system, 48, and the prefix, and 509, which was 
this one here that's making the announcement, which is a 24. So this is the information, validity status, and so on. Now, what happens now in this scheme if we have a new autonomous system, in this case, an autonomous system that doesn't have good intentions with this connection, but wishes to enter a connection that they are not authorized to, to access. So we have a new autonomous system, which is 6660, and it will it wishes to publish a prefix that does not belong to it. It's going to be a 200.7.85.0 slash 24, which in that case, this is the prefix it, that is being announced by a client, one of our clients that is connected here to this team. Now, this person with bad intentions is established the connection directly with the transit autonomous system, which is 65502. And remember, like I was saying, that they're going to prefer the shortest path. So in this case, he will be able to publish the announcement. He's going to publish this announcement here, and we're going to see then how the autonomous system 65501 is going to have this information. Now, because we have a validation scheme, he is going to receive the network through which point it is accessing it, but it will be invalid. This is because this prefix has already been, has generated its ROA and this prefix will be published by the autonomous system 65509. Remember the ROA we created for this prefix said it, we're going to publish it only through the autonomous system 65509. So when they do the validation, the digital certificate created will show that this is being published by the autonomous system that was not the one that appeared in the digital certificate that was created so it will appear as an invalid route and this does not coincide with the autonomous system and it has the same mask and the same prefix but it does not coincide with the origin autonomous system so in this way it will appear as invalid so now let us in the time we have left speak about the operating system and the validators that we have for the available software in order to establish our validator. And this can be installed in the server and has this validated cache that will connect with the repositories globally and will deliver information to the routers we have in our infrastructure. I will rapidly speak about four validators that are the ones that are often used in the infrastructures that use to validation. We have validator, the first validators that was available in terms of software for carrying out validation of origin. This is RIPE NCC's validator, RPK validator three. This validator is very much used. It was one of the first that was made available and has a graphic interface which shows you very easily the information delivered by this validator. We have the tools that come from Cloudflare, which is Octo RPKI and Go RTR. These are two tools. Octo RPKI is a full validator that you can install in a server. It will connect with the different repositories at global level compared to the other tool, which is GoRTR, which is specifically focused on delivering information of these routes that were found, whether they are valid, invalid or not found to the server, but all the rest is stored in cache. So it is different from Octo or PKI. <laughs> but above all, these tools, have been designed 
to be used in content networks. And likewise, information will be available, which is quite detailed, in order to find the information that is obtained. The other one is Routinator 3000, which is a validator generated by NLNet Labs. This validator, a webinar was organized at LACNOG, which explained quite well how this works. It's very, very efficient in terms of what you need, a sense of resources from the server and RAM and CPU. And this is a very useful tool that you can install. And the other tool that we're going to have is the Fort Validator. This is a project managed from Mexico and LACNIC. This validator will provide some further tools, not a, a, additional tools, but there will be a part that has to do with monitoring. It's very, very light and practically this validator can be mounted on a virtual machine. And let me show you the infrastructure that you have. You have the documentation will be available in the information is available in my presentation. And there you will also find general information as to how install it and configure it and so on and also information as to how you can download this software. This Fort Validator is a project, a joint project between LACNIC and Mexico. It will deliver, it will establish the connection with the repository that we have in the five internet registries. It will be encapsulated in information of the server and through the RTR protocol we will be providing information on the router. Having said, I finished the practical part and we can go over to questions. Here you have some tools that can be very useful when you start creating the rowers. Here you have the validators and you have several tools that are very practical and from the Milaknik site and other information, you have tutorials, webinars, as well as tools that you can use for validation, how we carry out the announcements generado y diferente documentación a nivel de RPKI. As well as communication on RPKI. I hope I didn't speak too fast, but now we have time for questions. Guillermo. Thank you, Erika. I think you can breathe a bit now. I don't know how you managed to do that. Well, we have questions. One is from Aide Herrera. So to carry out bring, do we have to agree with the providers and clients that have the ASN so that both do the ROAs? Well, yes. Ideally, if we have a peering connection or a transit connection, in fact, we can have all the routes that go through this hearing that are being validated. So the most important thing is to tell the different networks with which we are connecting to tell them if they are generating their rowers and how to reach these and showing them how this works. The only thing that you have to do is to enter the Midaknik app and then generate the rows for those prefixes that being announced in that peering or in that cache. Next, Maximiliano Colus. I didn't quite understand what would happen if a transit malicious 
transit as publishes that it is transit for a prefix that doesn't isn't really such in that case allow me to go back to my example maybe i went for i rushed through it now here This is important because in this case, this autonomous system that is being attacked in the network will have a shorter path to reach destination. It will reach the autonomous system AS501. So because it is publishing a prefix that is being used in our connection, but this prefix that is announced already was created and this digital certificate already is available, stating that it will only be announced from this autonomous system, A65509. It's the only one that can make this announcement. So if we have that, this other one would be making the announcement and we skip all this path here and directly reach this through the transit autonomous system, they would reach the destination autonomous system and we wouldn't realize what had happened if this was an announcement that we wouldn't wish to receive in this infrastructure, we wouldn't be able to visualize it if we didn't have the validation. But in this case, we can in fact identify that in the they won't know the backbone of the network. It will prefer this path to reach destination. If we're not doing any validation, it will start to do direct routing with that prefix without the authorization. But if we carry out validation, we will notice that the autonomous system is not correct it is invalid and we can take filtering actions for that announcement that we are receiving because we shouldn't be receiving it in the infrastructure and therefore it's something that can bring problems in the future. Does that answer the question? Well, several comments. Douglas Fisher said that the validator three of RIPE is at end of life, but this will be made available if someone wishes to continue it. And he's, Douglas Fisher says that the RPKI client would be assuming the place of validator three RPKI client is another validator that was not included in the list, but is also used and more for being used in the command line. A couple of questions on the response you gave to Aide. Alberto Bernal says, I'm not so sure about what you answered to Aide. As ISPs, we delegate prefixes to our clients to whom we provide, to them, we provide wholesale internet services. So should we do the rower, should the client do this? And Aide Herrera says, in order to do peering, isn't it necessary that the transit ASN should do ROA rowers with both ends, or is it necessary to do peering with all the transit ASNs? The rower should be created by the organization that has the prefixes, and this is very important. It's quite different from IRR. I explained this very rapidly today, but the authorization process for RPKI and for IRR is different in the case of IRR. It's the autonomous system that creates the route objects based on its clients. Sometimes this is done by the client and sometimes by the provider. In the case of RPKI, it is always the one that has the prefix. If the provider has the prefixes assigned by LACNIC and delegates this to the client, the one that has the prefixes assigned is the provider. So they will have to create the rowers. And this is in one of the slides that Erica showed at the beginning. 
Maybe we can put it up on the screen. Show the one where you show the rules of who has to create the ROA. If the organization has been delegated prefixes by LACNIC, sorry, his uh, connection is not good. Those that they have to create the they have uh, for the organizations uh, that have IP resources but no ASNs, they must create the ROAs, permitting each ASN upstream to announce the prefixes. And the creation is done by the one that has the resources. So the last question. Sorry, because Guillermo's uh, connection was unstable. For the generation of ROAs, Fabian Silva asks, we must we consider the prepend use in the AS path? I, I can answer it. No, in this case, the ROA is the last of the AS path. It, the, it's the um, autonomous system of origin. So with this, we would be closing our presentation. Remember that you can enter the networking room that is available. There, there you have the last slide. There in the networking room, we are going to be for about half an hour in case you have any questions. And then, yes, that's the last link down there. That's a networking room. You can go there to ask any questions if you wish. But uh, we just uh, have to thank you for having uh, been uh, present. And I now give the floor to Paula for closure. Yes, thank you, Erika and Guillermo. We see that there are two hands raised. Are they updated? Because you, you may have the time for questions. So Jose, Jose Adelmo Gonzalez, you can ask your question. Unmute uh, the phone. Jose, can you hear us? In the meantime, I'll give you floor to Javier Espina Navas. I don't know whether they have left. Haider Espina. Not there? Oh, that's a pity. Bueno, entonces, well, so. You are invited to the networking room if you have any questions or you want to discuss anything further. Very good. There are no more questions, right? Guillermo, Erika, no, there are no more. So very good. So I thank you both a lot because of all the knowledge you shared. And uh, I want to thank the participants for being all, with us all day. I hope you had a good time as we did. And before saying goodbye, I remind you that as the same as with the IPv6 tutorial, I invite those interested in that want to continue to share your views on secure routing to have access to the networking room. You, for half an hour, you may access through the link in the chat and in the slide. And remember to log in with your Gmail address. So we are starting tomorrow at 14 UTC. We'll have uh, the uh, board report, the financial report, and the public policy forum. So see you tomorrow.